All right, hello, um, welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM. Joining you as usual from a sunny San Diego. And today I'm delighted to be joined by Richard Clinton, who is in Pinehurst, North Carolina. How are you doing, Richard? I'm doing pretty well today. It's not yeah, sunny I, here. <laughs> oh, it's not sunny there. I'm sorry about that. Well, yeah. yeah. I, I, we're a bit greedy with the sun here, so yeah. <laughs> as you know. Um, and Richard, uh, over forty over forty years, has been involved in in many different things, with uh, planting and leading churches. And after receiving your doctor uh, doctor of ministry degree, you've been involved in teaching and training leaders in a variety of settings, including serving as an adjunct professor a number of graduate schools, and thirdly, a leadership coach and mentor to leaders. Uh, to help them get perspective of what is happening to them, um, which is so. F let's talk about that. Let's talk about the work you do with leaders. And um, so, would you say is when you work with the leader, the primary thing you do is give them perspective about where they are in their development process. So, um, so how do you actually establish where somebody is in their development process? Yeah, this this is based on a, a theory that my dad developed. Uh, I'm working with him most of that time. And he developed something called a leadership emergence theory, which is a uh, it's based on grounded research. It's a social theory where you do comparative studies of leaders one to another, done a ton of studies. And when you do that, patterns and how you, how time the time it takes for leaders to develop becomes clear, clear, the more comparative studies you do. So based on all of those comparative studies. Uh, we've developed some generic timelines for what happens in a person's or a leader's development and how long it takes. And so based on those things, we can pretty closely um, predict uh, about where a leader is. Of course, every leader is unique. So it, those, that's why we use generic, what we call timelines. And do those when when you look at when you look at somebody or uh, those uh, commonalities that you find uh, when you do the comparative studies do they do they break down into major categories or is it much broader than that Yeah we call we just call them phases phases of mm -hmm. time and so um, for example um, the most generic one we use and this is really super simple language we talk about foundations that's mm -hmm. generally about the first. 18 years or so. And then we have just the beginning development phase. That's another 10 years or so. And we have just the middle and that's about 20 to 30 years. And then we have the end. That's the most generic one that we use. And there's certain things that happen that are points of emphasis for development in each one of those uh, phases. Now we have much more specific Things. Sure. We mostly work in Christian settings where we use uh, ministry language to describe uh, what's happening to the person. But right. uh, we've used it in the marketplace. We've used it uh, with Christian leaders. We, it, it, the development phases are pretty, pretty common to people. Mm -hmm. And so um, one of the things that uh, I think often holds people back, which is, you know, why they need the help of, of people like yourself is, is self-awareness, right? Self-awareness, I think, is one of the hardest things, but it's one of the most liberating things when you when you uh, figure it out. But it's one of the hardest things I've always found in, in my career when you have people who maybe lack self-awareness, it can be very hard to point them in the right direction. Um, and it's a journey they have to go on themselves, really. Um, so when you work with when you work with um, leaders, do you find that they're typically they typically think they're at a different phase than they are maybe further on or further back or? Certainly here in uh, in this culture here in North America or in the Western world or in mm -hmm. America specifically, uh, most people these days tend to think of development as a race, and it's kind of whoever gets there first as in the fastest is the best. That's kind of some values of our culture which are not always helpful, and so that's a big tendency is they mostly see themselves as much farther along uh, than they are. So you take a typical mm -hmm. teenager, a young adult, you spend any time with them, you find out they mostly think they're very mature and they know everything about everything. And mm -hmm. it takes them a while to realize, oh, well, maybe I have more to learn. 
And that's often the case with leadership development as well. Yeah. Well, as I often say, you know, to, to my 17 going on 18 year old son is like, well, I'm just, I'm just too old to know everything. Sorry. <laughs> um, but, but yeah, it's, it, it, and I do think that's typical. I do. And you're right about the speed thing. And, and it is, uh, you know, that race to, to get ahead and that, you know, uh, the, the perceived like competitiveness and all of that. And, Therefore, uh, do you find that they, when they think that they're further ahead or they're trying to run before they can walk, that there are some fundamental pieces that they're missing that's going to undo them later on? Yeah, yeah a, a lot of it, you know. Um, so you, you look at people, how they handle their past, you know, how they mm -hmm. look back. And, and there's a couple of tendencies which people can really get stuck in. Um, you know, and so one of those is that they tend to think that everything that was bad that happened to them, everything that was negative, you know, they just they put it all in this category and they don't learn from it. So they they tend to get trapped in those patterns and they tend to, um, you know, get stuck. And so mm -hmm. that, that kind of leads them to thinking of themselves, if you, if you know, this popular cultural understanding of victimization you know mm -hmm. once you get labeled you are that and you see that all across the culture mm -hmm. and so leaders oftentimes if they have negative things happen to them or bad things happen to them they think that characterizes them and that that they will always be that and mm -hmm. it, so it really blocks them and, and and it limits them from seeing how those negative things or those bad things actually were very important in terms of their development you know they miss yeah. that yeah no i i i couldn't agree more and it's and it's something uh i mean i even had to go through that process myself of reorienting my thinking towards things that happened in the past um because now i you know now i believe you know we're on a journey and sometimes you know you take a path and I think we always, when we take a path, we expect it to lead to a destination, but sometimes it doesn't lead to a destination. It leads to another path or other paths or, or maybe just a stopping off point for a moment. And I think when you look at that, some of the things that you perceive as negative in the past, you, when you look at that, you say, well, I couldn't have got to this place if I didn't go down that path and then went to that path. And so reorienting your thinking about the past. Exactly. That, and that's what, that's what we try to do by giving uh, leaders perspective. We help them look back and try to reinterpret a bit. And most of reinterpreting isn't saying, hey, that bad thing was really a good thing. No, mm -hmm. it was a bad thing. Yeah. And uh, but you can grow from it. You can learn from it and you can let it strengthen you. And so we and we have so many examples of people around the world who have gone through horrendous things and have overcome them. They're definitely marked by them. And, mm -hmm. you know, they, they turn it into a positive by letting it build their character, maybe perseverance or the ability to handle tough situations or whatever. Um, mm -hmm. I, I imagine in your your area, you know, I don't know a lot about sales, but, you know, when you're selling stuff, you've got to learn how to deal with rejection. Sure. And if you've got something in your past <laughs> that sends you in a tailspin every time you hear a no, I imagine that uh, you're probably not going to go very far. So yeah. that's the kind of stuff we do is to help help people kind of look back, see that they're not the only ones who have ever suffered from that thing. And they can actually have it become something that forms them and shapes them in a more positive direction. Yeah. And I think the other thing, and you probably come across this, is uh, people – don't sometimes think or, or or believe how resilient they are, you know, that they've, until you look, you know, take a look back with them and you suddenly go, well, you overcame this, you got this. And they suddenly go, yeah, actually that's true. And you think like you, you going through those things, it's, it's going to give you strength for the future. Cause look at, look at all the things that you, you overcame and situations yeah. that maybe looked, you know, really bad at the time, but now you've come through it. So your, your capability. So taking, taking the past as looking for those, you know, pieces of strength to show you that you have the power to move forward. Yeah, I think you're exactly right. And it's, um, and just 
some kind of broadening your perspective is one mm -hmm. of the things we really try to help them do is saying that, hey, don't get so focused that everything relies on this one thing. It, it's, you know, we try to teach people how to look at their situation and see it as a learning opportunity. And, and so, mm -hmm. you know, like, for example, when I was watching my son, um, my youngest son loves video games and, and he plays some games that have some particularly big challenges in them. And, and uh, he, he'll just face that challenge and, you know, and it'll, you know, he dies or whatever. He has to be rebooted mm -hmm. and he just does it again. He learns and he grows. And I said, you know, if you would just do that in life, I said, you will, you will gain so much ground in your life. If, he goes, because you, I said, you don't expect to beat that big boss the first time, do you? No. And he goes, I go, mm -hmm. that's so much of life. You don't ever do it really well the first time. But if you yeah. learn and grow, I said, that, that's the, 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 what you need in terms of a pattern. So we try to help leaders do that, see those big, the bigger picture. Yeah, and I think that's it. Uh, I, I think that the whole thing is like taking and learning from those uh, whatever happened, you know, rather than keeping it as a, as a you know a weight on your back is like taking it and learning from. And I think, as you said, like culturally, I mean, we've become very good at like carrying all these weights on our back and kind of almost wearing them as badges of not yeah. badges of honor, but almost as get out of jail free cards, you know, to say, well, yeah. you know, I can't do this because of all this stuff happened to me in the past. Exactly. Exactly. That's, that's so, it, it's like putting yourself, you know, in jail time and time again, you, you never get free mm -hmm. and uh, you get trapped. And that, that's so sad. What are some of, when you've worked with the leaders, what are some of the um, maybe surprising insights that they have gained when you've gone through this process with them? What surprises them most? Um, in, especially in this day and age, one thing that surprises them is they're not alone. You know, they mm -hmm. always think they're the only person who's ever gone through this. And when you can show them, no, this is pretty, this is a pretty common pattern. And, uh, and here's how you learn from it. Here's how you go. That's always a surprise to them. Mm -hmm. They're always surprised that, you know, they always, everyone thinks it's them. And, um, and then, Showing them that change is possible, pointing out some models of people they can take a look at or watch or do what experience that have overcome something similar. That's huge. Mm -hmm. You know, you have someone yeah. that can no, that's, that's a fascinating point because, you know, the idea that thinking that you're alone or that this only happens, you know, this has happened to you. It's, you know, it's, it's never happened to anybody else, right? I mean, yeah. Clearly, obviously, yeah. clearly, obviously it, it has. So um, turning that, that thought around, but it, isn't it interesting though, Richard, that uh, even in today's like highly connected society and all of this, that people still feel isolated or feel on their own or that they're the only ones who have this issue. It's, it's quite a weird kind of dichotomy, isn't it? Yeah, it, it is. And, you know, the advent of social media and all the ways that we connect with people, mm -hmm. we would think it wouldn't ever be an issue. But um, all of that stuff has tended to isolate people and, mm -hmm. and we're not as, you know, and we don't share at deep enough levels most of the time to really get down to the place where transformation happens inside of us. We don't share mm -hmm. our feelings and our, our real selves. We always wear these masks. And, and so that's part of what we do when we, I work deeper with a person as I help them kind of see themselves for who they really are and then own it and, yeah. and and grow it develop it yeah as my as my fellow countryman uh, oscar wilde said you know you should be yourself because everybody else is taken that's great, <laughs> that is great. Uh, um so um the other thing the other thing that i think uh, as you say because we live in this we live in this weird kind of culture with social media and all of this and, and I the comparison culture I call it and it definitely makes people you know maybe somebody is in is a, a leader in business when then they see they see Richard's LinkedIn profile and they go whoa hang on a second he's way more you know look at all yeah. the accomplishments here and they just take you know, and they and, and fill in the blanks and then put themselves down and then I think the imposter syndrome starts to set in and that's something that seems to have 
uh, afflict an awful lot of people. I think we've probably all been through it at different times in our lives. Um, but I think that's something that holds people back a lot when they start doing these comparisons and they're, they're superficial comparisons. And then they start to think, well, I don't belong here. Yeah. I mean, that's one of the clear biblical principles that we help leaders with it. Don't compare. We're not supposed to compare ourselves. We're each one mm-hmm. uniquely designed and uniquely crafted. And we all have our own journey and our own story. So it's, yeah. you know, comparisons in, in boy, it, it happens in every business. You know, if you talk to pastors, they use the church size of the church comparison and the, mm-hmm. and then make value statements about themselves. And I, I've been trapped in some of that too. And it's, it's so unhealthy. It, it, it really is. So how do you how do you then how do you help people out who when you go through this process if you do discover that maybe it is imposter syndrome that they're suffering from? Yeah, I mean, we, the the thing is to help them. Um, we have a little, you know, every every group has its own little lingo. We call it destiny processing. It's finding mm-hmm. out who you really are and what you're supposed to be doing. At, um, in our situation, what. You know, we believe that comes from God. He, he's the mm-hmm. one that does that. He, he designs us, creates us, and then gives us a calling, we often call it. So in the Christian leaders that I work with, that's what you help them do. And you say, and it's unique to you. No one else can do this in the way that you can do it. You know, it can be similar to other people, but it, you don't have to do it like them. And so you need to find out. And so the other place where we help them with that is is we help them understand what their values are, you know, what, what their values right. are that guide them. And values tell us, you know, they kind of answer the question of why why we do something the way we do it. So we, we help them articulate their own unique values that can sound very similar, but they put their flavor on it. And then we, we help them live those values out, create a philosophy of life and a philosophy for what you're doing, the work you're doing that fits who you are, who you're designed to be, and then learn how to celebrate that. You know, you're not supposed mm-hmm. to do what X, Y, Z over <laughs> there is doing. You're, you're supposed to do you. And that's yeah. what we do at the end of the, you know, the development story. We try to help them. And then we try to help yeah. them learn to celebrate. Yeah, no, that's that's great, and and I love that. And uh, because I think for – and here's another thing I think that um, – the pervasive culture now with all the distractions of social media devices, all this kind of stuff is that, you know, people have lost the art of actually spending any time with themselves, right. Or spending any time with their own thoughts. I think maybe COVID maybe forced that upon some people, which if there's a silver lining to something as horrendous as that, it may have been that it made people more take time out to, to, to uh, spend time with themselves and figure out. Cause that's the thing is if you ask most people, What's your purpose? What's your values? You probably stumped them. Yeah, they have not. That, that's what we found is it, it, all, it all starts implicitly with us. We we take them on from all kinds of different sources and, mm-hmm. and, and, and we don't really even ask the questions. But one of the things we've seen in, in this development journey is that when you get towards the, the middle end to the end phase of development, there's a huge process where you go from implicit to explicit. And the reason is, uh, as you get toward the end of life, you're asking those big questions like, did I accomplish anything? Is it worth it? And all that. And one of the things that you want to you see is that, hey, I want my legacy to live on. I want to contribute something to the common good or the or, or whatever. And one of the ways you contribute is you pass on a philosophy, you pass on values. And that's when it becomes more you say, hey, well, what is it that I really have to pass on? Then you start passing on values. You know, techniques, yeah. methodologies are okay, but values are even better. Yeah, you know, I think because if you don't have the values, then those things are kind of papering over the cracks a little bit. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. All right, well, uh, listen, we're, we're coming up against the end of our time here, um, Richard. But before we go, like all Richard's information will be below here. But before we go, please do tell people a little bit more about you and what you do. Well, I'm in now. I'm in the process of launching a new uh, business slash ministry called Clinton Leadership 2.0. And, and what I'm trying to do is capture the legacy of the leadership work that my father started, and I'm beginning. I'm the 2.0. He's the 1.0. 
And, uh, and what we're basically trying to do is to reinter what I'm trying to do is to adapt and reinterpret my dad's work, which was done in an academic setting. And mm -hmm. I'm trying to bring it out into just the everyday life for leaders who never would have a chance to be exposed to it in an academic setting. So it's a lot of online training. It's a lot of leadership coaching. It's a lot of, of teaching. So that's what I'll hopefully be doing as long as I have energy for it. Yeah, well, fantastic. Uh, well, I, I encourage people to go check it out. Uh, you know, we, we all need we all need help. That's I'm I'm a big fan of coaching because I just think we all need help. And the great thing about a coach is when you work with the coach, right? They're just invested in your success, right? It's different from if it's a friend or a family member, because yes, you know, they may be invested in your success, but they may have other issues, things going on too. So having somebody who's completely <laughs> who's completely on your team is is always a good thing. Yeah, so that's what we're doing. Great. Well, listen, thanks again, Richard, and thank you for watching and listening, and I'll see you all again soon. Yeah.